Good evening, everyone. I'm your host, Jason Miles, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Before we start, if you're new to the channel, please hit like, hit subscribe, and don't forget to hit that notification bell so you are alerted whenever we go live. We're constantly adding cross streams with other channels and new shows. This Thursday, we'll be doing another one of our revolutionary reckoning shows with the Matt and David from Left Reckoning. Speaking of new shows, there is a new show I'm doing called Pop Life. And by the time you see this, I will have recorded the third episode of Pop Life. It's a show where I talk more about pop culture stuff for the third installment. I sat down with Toy Galaxy's Dan Larson, and we discussed some of the pitfalls of nostalgia. And that is going to go live tomorrow night at 6 p.m. So please, please check that out. Um, if you haven't seen the breakdown video uh, that we did of the NYC Hatchet Man, you should really check that out. MT has some funny stuff in that video that I missed the first time I watched it. I actually did watch it again, and I laughed equally as hard at some of the things that MT said. And the only way you can watch stuff like that live and be a part of the conversation is through Patreon. You have to become a patron. It allows you access to the champagne room. It also gives you access to our movie nights, which I promise this month we will be doing multiple movie nights. And that's saying a lot, considering... We're doing a live show October 23rd. It's coming up. Get your tickets now. Terragram Ballroom, Los Angeles, California. Give them an argument. Ben Burgess and Ryan Lake's going to be there, too. I just found out Ryan Lake's going to be there. Left Reckoning, Matt and David from Left Reckoning are going to be there. Derek Varn, Daniel Bessner, Anna Kasperi, and Nando Vila. Big Waz said he's going to be in the house. Many more names. I'm constantly getting shocked at who they're saying is going to be there. Well, you know who's going to be here is the Tuesday crew. And part of that Tuesday crew, the most important person in my Tuesday crew, is my co-host, my homie, my dog. You may know him as the man of the Mau Mau Hour. He is the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. How are you? Doing well, brother. Doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, let's bring in the hostess with the mostess. She is the faceless voice of reason that was trying to silence me before we went live. Please welcome, coming all the way live from a secret location in New York City, M. Toussaint. Hello, hello. I sent my friend the link to the Ashley Frawley trauma episode, mm -hmm. and she started watching it, and she was like, there's sound effects? I was like, yeah. <laughs> She was like, I had to explain to her there's a soundboard. And she was like, I imagine that can get old past. <laughs> I was like, he uses it tastefully. It's tastefully done. It's Don't worry about it. It's tastefully done. Yes. Very nice. You have to understand the inside jokes of the soundboard, right? That's true. That's very important. The, the adding of things that go on the soundboard as well, right? We've added a whole new drop. It's quite uncomfortable. There is someone in the chat who mm -hmm. regularly deletes their own comments. But they left a comment on our last show mm -hmm. about your sound drop with the hard candy. <laughs> thought it was hilarious. They thought it was hilarious there's there's more i wanted there's so many more i want to do but the way <laughs> to, to do them is kind of hard that's what she Andy, said i wish she said that <laughs> nine is a lot um side note mm -hmm. 
we do have to maybe you want to do it on the saturday show tucson or the champagne room where we create a dating profile for me <laughs> we let <laughs> we let the people we let the listeners of the show create a dating profile that sounds like wait a minute now <laughs> is he one his own dating profile <laughs> created by the listeners hold on a minute now <laughs> People ask me what I do on the on dating stuff, and then I give them the Hatchet Man clip. <laughs> oh my god, that they, might be a problem. It, apparently, they don't think that MT is as funny as I think she's funny because I think she's <laughs> fucking hilarious. I am. Um, I would agree with that. Thank the hatchet, like everybody, is just killing it on the Hatchet Man. Watching the comments because when I'm doing it live, you know, I can't see. The comments on the screen because I'm in a different mm -hmm. screen. So seeing the comments, oh dude, watching watching it, it's hilarious. Hilarious. So I don't know why I am not getting the swipes MT. Could it be the Pee Wee Herman and Clarence Thomas picture that I have up that says this could be us? Um either that or the Debbie Gibson uh <laughs> denim jackets. You'd be rocking. <laughs> this is my Broncos pride, even though oops, sorry, even though we've been losing Broncos pride. I understand that is a sports ball team. It is a football team. You can go after football. A non soccer <laughs> football team. I do want to play. I made a, a clip for today to get everybody ready for today. This is a most of the shows we do here are serious. I would yes. The, the six o'clock hour <laughs> is the serious hour. On your left says DJ Lance Outfitter Bus. Look, on your left, I think I've told the story or stories of being mistaken for DJ Lance while on tour with Yo Gabba Gabba. So I will never, as long as I'm black, and I plan on being black for at least another 30 years. Sure, God. It's another 30. I will never dress up like DJ Lance. Can't do it. No disrespect to Lance. Great guy. Love him like a play cousin. Can't dress mm -hmm. up. Well. Jack Black can. I cannot. cannot. But I did want to play this clip. Mm -hmm. You ready for the clip? Did you see the clip? Yeah, absolutely. I watched it. I don't think I seen it. Uh, see? He sent so clip. many clips. Wow. But this is one that wasn't like a, usually we send funny stuff. This was a serious clip. So to get you guys ready for the show today and Daniel Moak, our guest, I made this clip. So let's check this out. Making clips. Okay. Can you hear it, MT? MT? Yes. You got to move your cursor, though, down in front. I can't hear it. It's coming out of my computer for some reason, but it's coming through on the screen. Yes. Like, okay. Then I will shut up. Well, I think it's a breaking point of the school integration. I just don't uh, feel that they have a right to go to school. Since the end of educational segregation with the Brown v. Board decision, the integration strategy of the civil rights leaders like Thurgood Marshall helped to uplift a certain stratum of black people into the middle class, it still ignored economic disparity. Viewing education as a main function for upward mobility, are we putting too much pressure on schools to function as an answer to poverty reduction? Does the focus on education obfuscate other economic factors at play? We'll ask these questions and more. This is Revolution. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to. You could hear that? Yeah. yeah. That was so weird. It wasn't coming out of in my headphones. It was coming literally out of the computer. That's so strange. It's a Mercury Gatorade. All kinds of tech I'm issues. I'm sorry. What did you just call me? 
It's Mercury Gatorade. I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's astrology. Oh, got okay. Yes, it's valid. <laughs> Just accept it and move on. Our guest this evening, Daniel <laughs> Moe, is an assistant professor of government at Connecticut College. Daniel's main interests are American politics, race, and ethnic politics, public policy, and public law. His recent book, From the New Deal to the War on Schools, Race, Inequality, and the Rise of the Punitive Education State, is published by the University of North Carolina Press and shows how the embrace of education is a cure-all by liberal policymakers, both expanded the federal authority to support for K through 12 education, but also ultimately set education policy on a path towards punitive reforms. From his book, The Passage of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, ESEA, in 1965, represented a crucial juncture in the building of the federal education state and helped usher in this new educational order. The liberal incorporationist consensus that education was the most effective means of addressing the issue of unemployment and poverty created a powerful coalition in Congress to push for federal involvement in elementary and secondary education. The interpretation of poverty and unemployment as largely attributable to individual deficiencies in skill or culture drove the compensatory approach of the ESA in which funds were targeted towards the disadvantaged poor. The focus on disadvantaged students through compensatory aid was a significant shift as federal lawmakers had tried and failed to pass education aid for all students since the late 1800s. Federal policymakers built an education order in which faith in education as a solution to poverty, unemployment, and racial disparities led to the development of an increasingly punitive education state. Those on the left concerned with inequality, unemployment, and the status of racial minorities, but ultimately unwilling to fundamentally challenge the economic system, looked to education as the most effective way to solve these problems. By adopting an understanding of these problems as best addressed at the individual Rather than the structural level, these actors turn to education as an alternative to more direct economic redistribution or federal intervention in the labor market. Please welcome our guest this evening, who apparently is his, his screen off, Daniel Moak. Oh. oh, thanks for that, that welcome, man. I feel like I should... Uh... Have you introduced me to all my classes like that? <laughs> like that walk on song. Yeah. So that was great. Jason does do hype music. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I got it. I, dude, if this was like, my goal is to always make this show as if you were at the Tonight Show or something like that. And uh, you always want to come out to the studio audience applause. And now you're sitting at Johnny's desk. But Johnny is the three of us. Got or it. at least me. And you don't know what's in the cup, so. You know. <laughs> what's in the cup? <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, thank you for joining us this evening. Really appreciate uh, your book uh, and your work and your opinion. I'm going to just, we're going to take a dive into the deep end of the pool. What led the Civil Rights Coalition to pivot away from social democracy to racial democracy. And do you still seeing this uh, kind of racial democracy in in education to this day? Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess the short answer to the second part is yes. And I think it really plays a, a key part in explaining why we have sort of the political uh, situation around education that we do. So maybe just to take a step back and kind of define the terms a little bit. Uh, as I understand it, one of the central cleavages in uh, sort of the civil rights movement and, and black political thought in the 30s to the 50s uh, can be kind of you can divide the groups into two: one to the racial democ uh, democracy advocates, and another the more uh, social or economic democracy advocates. Um, and these 
uh, differed on sort of fundamental understandings of what accounted for the poor position of black people in the United States. So from the economic democracy standpoint, uh, this was a group of individuals that believed that capitalism uh, was fundamentally the most important thing that explained why you had uh, the poor position of black people in the United States, and therefore any political program that was going to advance political interests of black people required confronting broader economic and social structures uh, uh, in order to do so. so this, this would be people like uh, Ralph Bunch, uh, A. Philip Randolph, uh, that was sort of their their sort of understanding. On the other hand, you have uh, a group of sort of racial democracy advocates. And this was a group of individuals that really understood the fundamental problem with sort of America was that it did not effectively incorporate Black people into the existing economic structures. So it wasn't that the structures themselves were unfair or that capitalism was bad. It was that it did not give Black people a fair opportunity to enjoy the spoils of capitalism. Uh, so this was a group that really was pushing for uh, fair incorporation into the existing order. And so uh, people like uh, Thurgood Marshall, uh, Kenneth Clark, uh, and others are really uh, kind of the, the leaders uh, of this organization. Now, in terms of like why one ends up becoming dominant versus the other, I think you can look at sort of broader political economic factors that, that might explain this. So one of the things is that uh, many individuals in the uh, sort of economic democracy camp of the civil rights uh, movements are relentlessly targeted during the second Red Scare by uh, J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, uh, sort of others. Uh, and they really help facilitate the breakup of sort of that viewpoint. I mean, Thurgood Marshall is directly cooperating with uh, J. Edgar Hoover, and they're communicating in an effort to eliminate sort of this viewpoint from uh, the NAACP and from the civil rights movement more broadly. Uh, so some of the broader political context helps explain uh, sort of what, why one coalition dies out uh, and the other sort of becomes dominant. I mean, you can also look at other factors like when social efficiency uh, or uh, when uh, sort of uh, economic uh, Democrats really became uh, sort of prominent was during the New Deal, when you did have sort of widespread questioning of capitalism and what capitalism had wrought. By the time you get to the post-World War II era, you get sort of the recuperation of businesses, and that opening that had been provided by the New Deal is uh, rapidly closing. And you get uh, sort of the U.S. government is much more willing to uh, sort of adopt some of the programs and proposals of the racial democracy advocates because fundamentally it's still consistent with capitalism. And you can imagine a situation in which you address those demands while maintaining sort of the broader economic and social structure uh, of the country. So that's, I think, why we see uh, racial uh, Democrats winning out. But I think in terms of education policy today, you definitely uh, still see this. And I think a lot of times this shows up in discussions, of, uh, for me, most clearly about uh, sort of standardized testing gaps, where sort of the entire uh, sort of focus of standardized testing gaps uh, between Black uh, students and white students is a push to sort of narrow the gap without questioning the use of standardized tests more broadly. And, you know, as many scholars have pointed out, the entire purpose of standardized tests is to create uh, something that looks like a normal bell curve. And so when you see advocates pushing for closing standardized test gaps, it's sort of the most effective measure of whether or not the education system is racially fair, you are really advocating for a fundamentally inequitable education system. So I do, I do think that, uh, we definitely can see the legacy of the victory of the racial democracy framework in education to, to this current day, and that and, and in, in a lot of other areas as well. Daniel, I really appreciate that response because it really gets to the heart of something that is so important when discussing the subject matter. Because in today's liberal framework that dominates Black political thinking, it's very easy to say that we want racial equality, we want racial diversity, we want diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's very difficult to challenge those cap those those kinds of 
concepts from the left because people will say, well, what do you mean? What's wrong with diversity? Because one of our guests recently said in the age of neoliberalism, diversity has done very well for a certain type of black and brown person. But what people fail to realize is that when you have diversity, equity, inclusion in a neoliberal capitalist framework, in a capitalist framework overall, what that means is that since capitalism means that the means of production are only going to be so available for a certain amount of people over time and will continue to shrink, that the actual participation of larger numbers of people goes down and you get a, a growth of the pie at the bottom and you only get a very small growth, of, you get, a, you get a, a small tiny pie at the top. And it becomes difficult for people to realize this because they see all these images of, quote, unquote, black success. They see Oprah. They see Jay-Z. They see so on and so forth. It's like, oh, black people are doing wonderful. But at the same time, you know, during the Obama presidency, we had black child poverty rates that were at their highest in 40 years. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's uh, very well put. I think you know, Obama is an interesting person, particularly when it comes to education, because he is somebody that's very much caught up in this this type of rhetoric where uh, there's a speech. Michelle Ree. The what? Michelle Ree, is that her name? Oh, yeah. The uh, uh, education the, uh, secretary. former superintendent of the D- D.C. schools who yeah. uh, was passing, uh, uh, sort of seeking to transform the entire educational system of uh, DC schools be based around standardized tests, up to and including the fact that uh, janitor pay would be tied to student performance on the, the student testing. And the idea was that you kind of have to shame individuals into actually uh, providing uh, educational opportunity. And it's really based on this idea that rather than fundamentally addressing what is at the heart of inequality that we see today, which is the broader economic structure, lack of good paying job, declining unionization, uh, declining wages, what politicians are willing to do is advocate for something like equal opportunity. And Obama was sort of a master at this. This has been sort of something that has been uh, one of the calling cards of the Democratic Party at least since the 1960s. Uh, and I think in the current era, and you can see this with Obama, one of the ways that the racial politics gets weird here is that they fuse the idea that education can solve these broader issues, but also blaming education for not having done so already. So they say, look, we've already poured billions of dollars into the public education system. And because we know that education can solve racial inequality, we know it can solve poverty and unemployment, the fact that it hasn't done so means that we need to hold these schools accountable. And that's Do you th- what's, oh, go ahead. I just want to ask you real quick, sorry to cut you off, um, but it is to your point. Um, around the beginning of the Obama term, maybe it was 20, 2009 or 2010, the mm-hmm. documentary that I think was Gates funded, uh, Waiting for Superman comes out right. and becomes, becomes kind of a powerful indictment on the public school system and the lottery system to get into charter schools using, I think Detroit and then DC was also part of it as well. It really trying to, to make the point that you're making right now, that the only way out of economic disparity was the opportunity at equality education and tenured teachers were to be the problem, mm-hmm. not any sort of deindustrialization as the backdrop of the movie is deindustrialized Detroit. The problem in the movie and also becomes kind of a, a cry that we still hear to this day is that the system is broken. And with this broken system, we could we can't really achieve anything. And that's why we need charter schools. Yes. And I think I think that's exactly right. And then one of the things that you know, I found when I went back and looked at what is the origin of some of this stuff, is it actually traces back a lot earlier than I even thought when I started uh, looking into it. So uh, your question about sort of, uh, sort of almost ignoring the, the broader economic picture is, is, or your point about that is, is spot on. So one of the things I try to do in, in the book is look at when did the federal government really first get involved in this particular area of education? And uh, the first uh, time that you see this happening is in 
uh, the Great Society era, uh, sort of President Johnson, the Elementary Secondary Education Act. Traditionally, this is hailed as sort of a huge progressive victory because look, you're pouring billions of dollars of funding uh, into uh, the education system. But I think what gets ignored is the fact that the Democratic Party at this point had begun to transition away from its New Deal foundation of really this broader economic analysis. So in the 1960s, we begin to see the uh, early effects of deindustrialization and uh, automation start to hollow out some of the, uh, the urban areas of this country. And you begin to see a difficulty of individuals finding good paying jobs uh, uh, at good wages. Now, the Democratic Party in the, under the New Deal interpreted things like poverty and unemployment as a problem with the labor market itself. There's not enough good paying jobs to go around or the jobs that are available don't uh, pay enough. By the time you get to uh, the Great Society, there's a shift within the Kennedy and Johnson administrations to reinterpret what is the source of poverty. And a lot of this stuff is coming from the academic world with uh, mm -hmm. theories like culture poverty theory or human capital theory. Mm -hmm. And the new understanding is it's not the labor market that explains why somebody is poor. It's something about you individually that explains mm -hmm. why you're poor or can't get a good job. So it's not that there's not enough jobs to go around, that you are not bringing the skills necessary in order to go get a good job uh, or, uh, uh, or get sort of a good wage. And in this moment, this is when you begin to see the Democratic Party really look to education, I think, as an alternative to more inter economic intervention. And you see education promoted as the way to solve these social problems like unemployment, poverty, and racial inequality. On the one hand, this is great because you do get a huge uh, increase in federal spending and education, but it comes with the expectation that schools are going to solve these issues. And almost right away, you see uh, liberals uh, mm -hmm. and people like Kenneth Clark immediately turn against the school system saying, look, we have poured billions of dollars, giving you billions of dollars. These programs are, or these problems are still persisting. Mm -hmm. We now need to, to hold you accountable. So actually it comes from liberals. They're the first ones to propose things like uh, charter schools. The first charter experiments come from the federal government proposed by liberal social scientists as a means of breaking uh, the public school monopoly. Kenneth Clark, the author of the mm. doll cited mm. in, uh, uh, in Brown v. Board, is basically contracted to take over the DC school system in the 1970s. And mm. the first thing that he tries to do is tie teacher pay to test scores. This program really doesn't work because the Black-led teachers unit essentially forces uh, him to abandon this plan, but it's instructed that where this is uh, sort of emerging from has its roots in sort of uh, great society liberalism that had already begun to turn away from New Deal understandings. And of course, it gets picked up by Reagan and conservatives in the 1980s. But one of the things that's so interesting to me, to me about education policy is the degree of bipartisan support for these types of policies. Uh, well, it's and I kids. Think, right. Right. It's yep. kids. And yeah. and you were first, so you are from a red state. Yes. You are from my favorite city in that state. It is not Missoula, it is Billings. Okay, yep, I'm, uh, I grew up in Billings, yeah. So uh, actually, it, it shaped my, my understanding of this. So, that's what uh, I wanted to ask you about. How do, yeah. how does what you're talking about right now, this, this liberal shaping of education, how does it affect young Daniel in his senior year of high school which I don't want to say what year that is, so all of us other people on screen won't feel old. So yeah, I was actually sort of most consequential in my junior year when uh, the uh, teachers in my school district decided to go on strike. Uh, uh -huh. I remember being in the, my parents' basement with my younger sister, and when the strike was announced, of course, the immediate reaction was literally locking arms and jumping up and down for joy that we did not have to go to school the next day. It's not the most sort of intellectual <laughs> response, but it was how I felt in the moment. Uh, paid for it later, though, because for all the days that we missed, we got to go to yeah, go back, yeah. school on Saturday. And mm. Saturday, oh, they had Saturday? We had Saturday school, so that was, that was a lot of fun. But throughout that process, it kind of allowed me to talk to some of my teachers about what was going on, and that was where I first sort of heard about what No Child Left Behind was, uh, sort of how 
the conditions that they were facing in the classroom were were shifting, what was happening to uh, sort of their pay and sort of their uh, autonomy in the classroom as well. So it was really formative uh, to me in understanding sort of the political nature of education. And then, I mean, by the time I got to grad school, it was something I was already interested in. I was in Philadelphia. And when I was there, it was right when Philadelphia was going through what many big cities were going through at the time, which was shutting down a ton of public schools. Mm -hmm. So I started going to those meetings and the dynamic was really interesting because it was an almost all black uh, appointed commission telling local uh, school community that they were gonna shut down their school and there's nothing they could do over the uh, sort of most uh, strident opposition that you could imagine. But it was clear that there was no sort of connection there. And what you saw was closing down and moving toward what they called the a portfolio model, which was sort of charter schools or magnet schools. And uh, I guess that's sort of really what sparked my interest in seeing the ways in which uh, this really touched at the heart of something uh, that was deeply personal for a lot of people. Almost everybody has some experience of going through the education system. Uh, and then trying to understand, well, what is driving both the dynamic in Philadelphia, but then also in Billings, Montana? and uh, I guess the book is partly me trying to make sense of that. Passing on. Do you think that the charter school movement initially it was to start it without a doubt to neutralize the capacity of public schools to give education to communities? Well, I mean, I think there's probably multiple uh, origin stories for this because I think you can, some of the origin go, can be traced back to uh, the union movement, which was saw it as a way of getting, you know, perhaps teachers more autonomy and uh, ability to experiment. Uh, but it also has origins in kind of what I was talking about earlier, which uh, you had early critics begin to refer to the public school system as a um, as a monopoly that needed to be attacked. And one of the ways to do it was either through vouchers or through charters. And I mean, one of the crazy things for me to realize was that the way that that language migrates from the left to the right seems to happen through uh, a liberal federal program that was trying out these different voucher schools uh, in different areas of the country. And one of them was in California. And the governor at that point was Ronald Reagan. And it seems to be his first exposure to vouchers as an idea was through this liberal idea that was funded by the federal government and he picks it up and runs with it um and i think that there are uh the dominant mode within it now i mean there are different forms of charters there's public charters and, and sort of private charters but i do think it's very difficult now to say it's anything other than an attempt to dismantle one of the few remaining public goods that we have Pascal. Well, the question I ask is that why is it so much of the work around charter school, particularly racialized, in a way that it's made to seem like the silver bullet for the educational concerns of black and brown communities, which you don't hear any of this fever pitch around charter schools around white communities? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's uh, that's really interesting that, you know, one of the things that you know, public polling consistently shows is that uh, people in sort of wealthy neighborhoods like their public schools, which go figure, they get a lot more funding and have a lot more uh, uh, sort of access to it. And those individuals are not clamoring for uh, charter schools in their own neighborhood, for sure. Uh, but I think uh, there, there's complicated roots to this because there are, you know, some evidence that uh, there is support within uh, some uh, sort of black cities for uh, charter schools and where I'm from Oakland. Right. So yeah. I think I, if you look sort of to the origin and then that back in the 1960s and 70s, you saw uh, sort of black nationalist approaches or analyses of the problem sort of indicated that uh, local control was essential to sort of building up the type of institutions that would actually be responsive to the demands of uh, sort of the black community and therefore sort of wresting control from the public school monopoly was central to sort of that project. So I think there is 
uh, that is part of the story of what's going on. And I mean, part of that is just a response to the reality that there was, were incredibly unresponsive public schools throughout the country that were not addressing the uh, sort of demands uh, of the community, but that fed into sort of this desire for alternatives to uh, schooling as a public good that now in this current day and age begin to look like uh, support for, for charter schools. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's incredibly depressing to see sort of that history uh, uh, but it's something I think if you're interested in pushing back against sort of the charter school uh, uh, movement, you have to understand that and come up with some way of addressing that concern. Schools actually have not been in some areas particularly responsive. What do you do about that is not turn it over to charter schools, which have shown no ability to actually address well, I mean, a, a big problem with charters is when they're not profitable, then they close. Right. So when you've closed public schools for charter schools, even if the charter schools are like a success in the sense of kids are coming out and there's a positive environment, maybe they even have alternative ways to discipline like meditation and all this other great stuff. Um, if those schools aren't deemed profitable, then it's, and then there's no school for the, for the entire area. Right. Uh, I think one of the things that's like completely unaccounted for in uh, the charter school sort of movement is the incredible amount of churn that has to happen uh, as sort of part of this. So you, there's a great Washington Post article from a couple of years ago that really sort of focused on what it actually looked like. And it was following parents in, uh, I believe, the D.C. area that would just move from one charter school to the next to the next, like three in the same year, precisely mm -hmm. for the issue of the issue that you just said that uh when it's not profitable uh then they can just uh shut down and leave uh and i think that should also be a, a question of sort of understanding like what's actually going on in the the inside and what would make charter schools profitable and part of that has to do with educating the easiest to educate kids so one of the most consistent findings that we see coming out of the charter school literature is that they really don't uh, they systematically undereducate uh, students with severe disabilities because they are incredibly difficult or expensive to educate. Uh, charter schools have a range of ability to sort of choose the students that they want to educate. So, mm -hmm. on the front end, you know, you can have a difficult application process that sort of allows you to screen out uh, certain uh, individuals. And then on the back end, once you know, kids are already there, uh, a lot of these charter schools. Uh, have as a central aspect of their whole plan disciplinary practices that allow them to suspend or kick out kids that they don't want to educate. And uh, so you can see a way of targeting and sort of reducing the uh, uh, population of who they want to educate that public schools don't have available to them and just don't do because their mission is different. Their mission is not profit. Uh, uh, it's more of a public mission. So. I think understanding some of those those key differences of what actually having a for-profit school means on the ground and for students uh, is something that's really important to understand. And I mean, if you're making a pitch to parents, I think that is something that they can understand too. It's like, do you really want a school in which uh, you, you, you would, think, yeah. I, I don't, I, honestly, uh, I don't know how Pascal feels about this. I don't think most parents give that much of a damn about the idea of public goods or school for profit it basically boils down to test scores and this is a safe place for my child is my child going to get a leg up i think ultimately most parents see the world through a capitalist very neoliberal lens they don't even understand it it's just so ubiquitous in their reality that uh is this going to get my kid a leg up the Dion sanders school for <laughs> <laughs> fast black kids yeah. i mean i don't know if you remember a few years ago i don't know if you're a football or a sports fan at all daniel yeah um do you remember when Deion sanders uh was got caught on tape beating up uh the the person that was running his charter schools because it wasn't making enough money i did not see that you have to send me a 
<laughs> he was talking about the skim. Oh I had a friend, and I had a friend that worked for uh, Jalen Roses stuff in, in Detroit, and said it was a nightmare. I mean, why do you well, think? Why? I guess you would ask people the question, like, why do you think all these athletes get involved in starter schools? Yeah, I mean, one of the I was just looking at some literature the other day, and uh, there's an organization that looks at where federal dollars and sort of the charter schools actually go. Uh, and they found that uh, last year, uh, I think they were looking at the last decade or so, that the federal government had given $4 billion to charter schools that either never opened their door or had already shut down within that decade. So it is a huge grift in terms of public resources just being pulled out of uh, public schools and sort of put in the pockets of, uh, uh, of people that already are fantastically wealthy. I mean, Michelle Rhee, after she did not get the uh, Secretary of Ed job in either the Obama administration or the Trump administration, which she was actually also up for, which would give you an indication of that was insane when I when I read that in your mm -hmm. in your intro, I was like, that's insane that yeah. she was was she was up and he and she won like awards under Trump, didn't she? Yeah, she yep. Yeah, uh, Bethy DeVos's organization gave her um, <laughs> uh, sort of an award for. Uh, her education program, which also Cory Booker got a, an award from the same uh, uh, same organization. That was kind of before he found religion on this issue, or at least <laughs> sort of right. Uh, awesome. So I think, uh, yeah, I mean the 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 broader political uh, sort of orientation of both parties is sort of very much in this direction. But Michelle Rhee is now in Sacramento running a charter chain with her husband who i think was uh Kev I don't know if he but he was the mayor of uh kevin uh, uh the basketball player right yes yep oh what yeah. is his name who knows the basketball player that is he was mayor of sacramento i don't know if he's still mayor of sacramento kevin not kevin johnson what was his name like i ran into them once in san francisco they were doing something in the city and i saw yeah. them my first was thought was, oh he's not that tall yeah. Kevin Johnson. Yeah. Oh, Kevin Huffman. She has two spouses here listed, and they're both named Kevin. Oh. Are you being serious? One of them is Kevin Johnson, the basketball player. Okay, so that's the first husband. She's got another husband now, I think. That's just Kevin, the janitor. This is confusing. This is <laughs> I've never seen that before. Kevin, the pool boy. She likes guys named Kevin. This is what we learned. But was he black? That's the oh, real question. Wait. There's no pictures Did on she this part. So. Go back. <laughs> this is not time to prove your thesis, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Pascal, you have a question? What I was going to say is that what you're really demonstrating is that how pimping out of the charter school thing is just the, the coolest. It's, it's, it's almost a form of hustle culture in certain mm -hmm. communities, if you will, to turn out Diddy had a charter school, rappers mm -hmm. having charter schools, athletes having charter schools, you know, mm -hmm. uh, black capitalists having charter schools. And it's, it's their it's way so, to give back. It's it's the, it's, the win, it's, the, it's the greatest win-win of all, right? The charter school, I won in life by being a jillionaire, whatever I am, and I'm going to give back to said community by having a profitable school. LeBron James kind of had an interest, and, and I want to ask you about this, Daniel, and I want to ask you and Pascal about this. So LeBron James had an opportunity to have a charter school, and he did not. He had a public school in the area that he grew up in, I believe it's Akron, Ohio. And his public school had crazy resources, and it has, I don't know, I'm, you know, I'm assuming it still exists, uh, like washing machines, because some kids didn't have the ability to wash their clothes. There was a person on site that helped parents navigate through the bureaucracy of social services. Um, food for children that they could get whenever they needed it. That school probably should be a model, maybe, moving forward of what public education can look like. Again, if I'm not mistaken, he made this a public school. But it almost felt like it was some sort of window dressing 
for LeBron as the new Magic Johnson. Mm. And oh. the public education route was just a new wrinkle. So he's not putting Starbucks in the hood. He put ah public school in his neighborhood. What do you guys think about that whole thing? A branding exercise? Wow. Is that a way to possibly possibly consider it? Could it could have been viewed as a branding exercise? Yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I think it's possible. Yeah, I, I, I'm generally, I you know, I got my political education about charter schools and the damage they did from Bruce Dixon, who was my mentor at Black Agenda Report, who was a longtime student school act advocate, who had been talking about the the wave of these charter schools for years, and how the damage they do to public school education and the teachers unions and teachers overall. And I, it, it just became so transparent to me how particularly upper middle class members of the black political class were using this as a wedge issue to get a toehold on black education and become enemies of black public school teachers and union members at the same time as a money making effort. And it reminded me, it heralded so back to me, so much back to me, to the Booker T. Washington industrial education model of the 19th century. That we create these, these these shallow ass schools who don't really do anything, but they financially, you know, give some of us a, a grift enough that we can do well because we're opening them. I mean, that's really interesting. I, I think uh, there's a, a lot there. One, I definitely want to sort of echo your point about sort of one of the things that the charter schools are doing is an attack on teachers' unions. It should be understood as that most charter schools, not all, are not. Uh, are not uh, sort of unionized, which means sort of higher rates of teacher turnover, uh, uh, lower teacher pay. So it's really under, uh, important to understand that sort of political motivation for pushing it uh, as well. And I mean, I think Jason, to your broader point about you know what is actually going on here, I think great. I mean, it's good. I guess absent other things that that he did this, but I think one of the things that I would want to push a against is trying to solve these issues through the schools. It's wonderful to have well-resourced schools, and we should. We should have schools that have enough counselors uh, that provide uh, food for kids that don't have it otherwise, uh, sort of school nurses. But we also should not have kids that are coming to school hungry. We should not have uh, sort of these extreme inequalities that are leading to uh, problems that are popping up in the schools. And as long as we continue to think that we can solve these issues through simply shifting the educational dynamic rather than directly confronting uh, sort of the economic uh, status quo, then we're, it's a fool's errand and it's only going to come back on the schools themselves and sort of push it in a, in a further uh, a punitive direction and one that pushes even more towards privatization. Uh, and Pascal, I want to pick up on your point about sort of this industrial uh, education. Because I think one of the things that is lost here is how narrow the vision of what education is supposed to be has become, in part because once schools were expected to solve these economic issues, one of the things that we see is people tend to value education almost, not everybody, but a lot of people tend to value it almost exclusively in terms of what is it going to do for my future earnings on the job market? Like I cannot tell you how many times sort of as a college professor that students uh, want to know what sort of political science, or I was in an African American studies program, what African American studies is going to allow me to go out and earn. And on the one hand, I can understand that perspective because that is sort of what's beat into them from uh, the get go. And in a time of scarcity, perhaps it makes sense to think that way. But what gets pushed to the side is any notion that education should be driven by what is genuinely of interest to you, or education is a way of building a community or of growing and learning together. And it feeds this hyper individualization and competitiveness that is tied almost directly to the value of education for what it's actually gonna do for you uh, on the future labor market, which completely sidesteps the question that there aren't enough jobs to go around on that broader labor market. Hmm. M2 Sun, do you have any thoughts? I'm sure you have some questions. Um, I just think that I've seen it on the on the parents end. Uh, I had a friend, her sister, her older sister had a son and she would have done anything to get him into a good school. There's a certain elitism that goes with it. 
And even the kids have it. They'll tell you what school they go to and that they're on the honors track and AP this and that. And they're like eight. Right. It's um definitely a, a prestige thing. I mean, as I think it's a prestige thing also for someone like LeBron. I think my my psychoanalysis of LeBron is that um greatness haunts him. He's never going to be Muhammad Ali. He's never going to say no to a dollar either. Um, and this was his way to try to be kind of great. He couldn't even stick to a strike. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, the. I guess the sad part about the LeBron thing, in my opinion, was it was almost like he did this thing that it sitting alone it's like wow and there really wasn't even a comparative analysis either like this is what a regular public school looks like this is what a charter school looks like in this area and this is lebron's public school mm-hmm. i think i think kids got bikes to to get to school if you live too far you know it it was kind of almost a perfect situation where there's a man a, a daddy warbucks that can kind of solve every problem that you may have in a public school um i i can't i couldn't tell you what conflict resolution looks like i can't tell you what teacher pay looks like i'm not sure um and i don't even know if he still has the school to be honest with you. who knows if he's still even dealing with it um being that he's in la but it's sad because at that moment i think he could have done more especially with his celebrity and especially with his platform um, to get these conversations out in a broader perspective. So we can say what you were saying earlier about, you know, parents understanding the difference between the plus of a public education opposed to a school that is literally designed uh, with a profit motive. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. he was never going to do more than Oprah. Oh. Shots <laughs> fired. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's pretty mean. She's the standard. She is kind of the charity standard, right? Mm-hmm. In in twenty twenty two, what does that make Kanye yeah. then? Oh, here oh. we go. See, okay. <laughs> Kanye here discourse. Go. <laughs> Kanye, Kanye discourse. We coming for you, nigga. Every time. The they coming Kanye. for him, though. They all coming for him. Everyone because of the shirt friend. can you so okay daniel yeah yeah you're the you're the principal of a public school in the inner city of billings <laughs> you're downtown billings you're right by the, <laughs> the bus station <laughs> you're right <laughs> you're right by the gray <laughs> i wonder if anyone knows billings that's yeah. watching this show <laughs> You're right by the Greyhound station. You just built a new school. And the eight black kids I mean, <laughs> in all the buildings. Too many already. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come to school with their White Lives Matter shirts. Do you make them take it off? Well, I mean, I got to work. They definitely, uh, I think political messages they were fine with. Uh, and in that part of Billings, that probably would not uh, bat an eye. Like, I remember being there and seeing uh, not my president or Obama. <laughs> so I mean, right, I, you I did. flew all over the place. So yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, would I make them take it off? Uh, sure. But you know, there'd be a whole other host of things that I would do as well. So mm-hmm. but, but yeah, I'm a strict dress code enforcer in this scenario. My my brother went to a Christian school and he had an Elvis belt buckle when he was like a sophomore, junior in high school. And the vice principal came up to him and said, son, you take that belt buckle off. There's only one king in this school. His name is Jesus. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Love it. You guys set some rules down. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see if Daniel's going to, you know, 
He's talking all this big talk about what schools are. Would he make the kids take off the White Lives Matter shirt? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I would. I, White Lives Matter, you're, you're going. Uh, you might even be expelled. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. I, feel like, I feel like they would get hoisted on the shoulders of the football team. And <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I have to ask, why is Billings your favorite city in Montana? Um, there's a place called the Rail Yard. Oh, yeah. Um, and I used to play there. There might even be a poster around here somewhere from the Rail Yard. Okay. And uh, I got to know the the dude that would promote shows there. Um, I won't say his name on air. He, he is a comrade. And we were on tour in 2019. And we had just played Bozeman, uh, the, yeah. F- the Phillips station or something like that in Bozeman. And the guitar player's amp had blew. And we had to go, I can't remember where we had to go. Maybe Minneapolis, somewhere. Somewhere nowhere. <laughs> and and our, our our boy, my boy, who I've been, I've been playing shows at the rail yard for years. Um, I told him I needed an amp. And at two o'clock in the morning on a humbug, we drove through Billings and he handed me a very nice, this really cool Laney amp. And we were able to finish the tour. And afterwards he was like, dude, just keep it. Man. Wow. So I have a special affinity for, and also I have good shows. The place I got to meet a lot of cool people. Um, so yeah. And, and Billings was much better than Butte, Montana, where, oh. Well, I mean, that's a low bar to trip over. <laughs> Where I was <laughs> literally had a security person like, hey, I'm here to protect you from the people. I'm like, then I'm playing for it? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, so, that's great. No, I have a. I have Mason a, has played every major and minor city all over America. And I play the He's shit been out everywhere, of the minor man. ones. everywhere, man. Shit out of the minor ones. I play like six shows in Montana. Man. Nice. No, it's not MT. Montana is the scariest place for black people to be. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I have a friend of mine who was half black, half Native American, who grew up on a Native American reservation in Montana. Yeah, I, mean, I think that was rough. the the most uh, sort of racial diversity that we had at our school was definitely the Native population. So at my school, I'd pretty big native population, but yeah, I mean, I think I'm not being facetious when I say eight is too many in terms of estimates. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, what's funny Dan? I, I'm, I bet we might even know some of the same people. Cause that scene in Billings is just so small. Sure. Yep. But no, I, I, w- I always had a good time there and considering, you know, the drive from Seattle and the next major metropolitan city east of Seattle, people always forget, is Minneapolis. Wait. <laughs> 1,500 miles. So Montana definitely helped. And North Dakota helped us fill up those, those 1,500 miles. But, Daniel, thank you very much for hanging out with us. Uh, will you be joining us in the Champagne Room? Sure. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm good. Um, if, you, if you're down to join, if you're coming on, uh, he's been in the chat. New York Times columnist Bertram Cooper, who got mad at me, he said, "Why am I not on this panel? This is a show that I was made for, Jason." So Bertram's going to join us. He's 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 very excited to uh, to speak with you on your work in education. Um, he did some really great work on on poverty. Uh, his his article was rather edited. <laughs> it's the it's the Times. <laughs> Pascal writes for Newsweek. You know, <laughs> it's edited. They edit, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> they said Bertram. They said you are a New York Times columnist and male model. Take that, Bertram. You handsome, nappy headed. Beige man. Should we leave? It's getting hot in here. <laughs> well, thank you guys 
very much for watching the show. Please tune in tomorrow at the same time, 6 o'clock, for what I think was a very, very uh, enlightening interview that I had with Toy Galaxy's Dan Larson. He, he actually said something off air very kind. He said this is the only space he gets to talk seriously about things political. So even though the show is called Pop Life, you know it's going to get political. It's what we're talking about, right? So check that out. It's a it's a fun conversation. And we don't just talk about Star Wars toys and cartoons the whole time. I promise you that. It is a very serious discussion with a good friend of show. Pascal, do you have any parting words? I want to thank, uh, thank Danny for coming on to talk about a very, very fraught with controversy subject, public, public schools, charter schools, public education, and the history of the racialization of those things. I want to thank you very much for coming on. We'd like to have you on again to really yeah. get into the weeds of the subject matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I'd like would to thank to, you. Oops. I would love All to right. get you to talk about Thurgood Marshall. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Maybe we should talk about Thurgood. That's what we'll do. We should go to Champagne Room. We'll talk about Thurgood Marshall. And yeah, I'll shut up now, MT. I had no problem with that. I just want to thank you for shaking it up with the uh, academics and their backgrounds. I like uh, the mantle with the bookcase yeah. and then books on the mantle. Oh, there you. was a complaint in the chat. You got a seven out of 10. There was a complaint. <laughs> That yeah. your books were thin. Oh, okay. none of your books oh. are thick. Yeah, okay. they're not thick enough. Yeah, oh. I need to, to work on that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Major thing to work on. People assume that Pascal has the thickest books, and so got to stand up to Pascal's imaginary bookcase. That's how he gets the ladies with the thick books. <laughs> Say, T H anyway. I C C. <laughs> <laughs> I like my books like I like my women <laughs> used. <laughs>